Back in 1971, um, there was an African-American man in Queens, New York, who was rear-ended by a bus. And he used the settlement he got from that, that court case he won um, to open his, his dream was to open a dry cleaning business. So he opened a dry cleaning business and um, he called it Jefferson Cleaners and his business was so successful, he was able to open two more dry cleaning businesses. And when that happened, um, he was able to move out of Queens and away from his racist neighbor. And he was, <laughs> he was able to move to um, a deluxe apartment in Manhattan. And, um, and this all the way up into the 80s. Have you guys heard this before? Yeah. And um, he was able to get this really sarcastic maid. And they even wrote a song about it. We're moving on up to the east side to a deluxe apartment in the sky. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you guys caught on to what was going on there. We finally got a piece of the pie. Yeah. Jefferson Cleaners. Um, 70s, 80s sitcom called The Jeffersons. And that started out. They were next door neighbors to Archie Bunker. Did you know that? Yeah, there you go. They were. Isn't that interesting? They moved up uh, figuratively and literally. They moved up financially. They moved up in social status. They moved up literally and figuratively when they went from Queens to Manhattan to a high rise, right? So they were moving on up. Isn't it interesting that in our culture, progress or success has a direction, and that direction is up. We have a metaphorical direction for progress. Upward. If people do well, they move up in life, right? You climb the corporate ladder. Yuppies are upwardly mobile. If a baseball player in the minors, his whole dream is to get called up. Oddly enough, uh, to make a circle here, um, every year in my worldview class with these high school juniors and seniors, I show them a clip from Oprah Winfrey when she has a bunch of her new age buddies on and they're talking about the secret, which... At, by this time, isn't a secret anymore. But anyway, if you've been on over, you're not a secret. But the whole, their whole point is that the universe wants good things for you, which on Oprah means more money and health and a better spouse. And, um, and the universe vibrates at a high frequency. And if you can get your life to vibrate higher, that will cause the universe to manifest good things for you. And oddly enough, I show this clip to him, and there's this guy right in the middle of that, literally quotes the song from the Jeffersons, we need to move on up. And he like starts singing a little ditty, and I'm like, wow, the Jeffersons had more going on than I thought they did. Um, as disciples of Jesus Christ, when we talk about following Jesus... It's interesting, do we talk about a direction? Like, when we talk about seeking the kingdom, like, is it a location? Is progress or growth as a Jesus follower, like, is it up, is it down, is it over? Is it around? Which way are we going? Like, if we're going to set the GPS on Jesus, where do we set the G GPS, right? Like, go, Go, okay, right? This morning I'm beginning a new series in the Psalms of Ascent. These are Psalms 120 through 134. So I'm going to be here. Um, it just so happens these end the Sunday before my, my wedding anniversary. Didn't mean to plan it that way, so I'll be gone the week after I finish this. Nothing happens. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and these are psalms called uh, psalms of ascent. These are psalms for going up. Um, and, and scholars have, have 
explanations to this, but I think there's one that makes the most sense. I mean, there are some who say that there were the exact same number of steps at the temple and that the priest would quote one of these psalms and move up to the next step. But I just don't think that makes sense if you actually read the psalms. These just sound like psalms from the mouth of an everyday person who lives in an everyday place somewhere in Israel. These are prayers, these are songs from someone who's on their way to the temple. And if you know about the geography, you know that if you travel to Jerusalem from anywhere, you travel up. Um, You ascend. Now, we're going to see in these Psalms that it's going to be called Mount Zion. It's it's not a mountain. It's it's 2,500 feet above sea level. So that's not the Rockies, right? It's not even the Smokies. Um, nonetheless, it's up. If you've ever been there, you know, you go, you go up. Um, so the Psalms of Ascent, um, if you look at them, they're, they're songs of ascent, um, prayers that were prayed, songs that were sang as the people made their pilgrimages to Jerusalem. And they prayed as they went because it was a very big deal to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And my hope is that as we go through these psalms that we will pray as we go. And we, we do, right? We pray as we go. We sing as we go, don't we? We do that. We, we gather and do that, and then you do that in your life. And my goal as we go through these is, is to, every week, give you a new prayer to pray. And then we will all be praying the same prayer together. Um, We're not going to ascend, that I know of. Um, But each week looking and saying, why would they have prayed that way? What are they praying for? Then how can we pray similarly? Um, And I'll give you a prayer that you can pray on your little journey, your adventure with Jesus. And then a prayer that you can pray as you prepare to gather but today I'm just going to introduce them. I'm not, it starts with 120 next week. Um, but the Jews of these, these days would have primarily had what were called three pilgrimage, pilgrimage festivals. And what that means, three festivals that would have required travel. They may have gone more for various reasons, but three was in Exodus and Deuteronomy were the ones you went to. If you were like a really, really observant Jew, you went three times a year. And they were at the very, very beginning of spring, the very end of spring, and then fall at harvest time. So the festivals came at planting, at first fruits, and at harvest. And so these festivals were kind of built into this yearly cycle of life for the family as well as the nation because it was also built into the birth of the nation and the giving of the law. And so there's this cycle to the pilgrimage, this festival cycle of repentance and sacrifice and thanksgiving and blessing. So every year, three times a year, if they were keeping them all, they would ascend (laughs) to Jerusalem to gather with the rest of the nation and you would maybe see people you hadn't seen since the last festival, the the population of of Jerusalem would just explode and you would gather as a nation to meet with God. Now, we we understand that they knew that God was omnipresent. They knew God was everywhere, right? Like, this this is what made Israel different than the nations around them. Their God was not regional. Right, you didn't cross the border and God wasn't there anymore. You got a new one. Um, they knew that they could step outside their house and no matter where they lived, the heavens declared the glory of God, no matter where they were. That was their God that did that. Yeah. Two of these Psalms of Ascent, number 121 and number 124, call God the maker of heaven and earth. So Israel knew for certain their God made heaven and earth and that 
he would not be confined by what he made, much less by a temple. Even Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, you remember the story? He's got a stone for a pillow and God shows up and he said, God was here and I didn't even know it. (laughs) Right? So it wasn't that they didn't think God was anywhere else. They didn't think God lived in the temple like a rabbit in a cage. As a matter of fact, one of my one of the prayers I love the most is, is Solomon dedicating the temple. And he talks about his dad wanting to build a temple, and, but he, but he, and he makes this prayer. He's talking about the covenant. And there's this prayer he prays. He's dedicating the temple. It says, will God really dwell on earth with men? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. Like, really, God? You're going to come live here? You, can, you don't even fit in the universe. How are you going to fit here? How much less this temple I've built... Yet, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night, this place of which you had said you would put your name there. And may you hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. Hear the supplications of your servant, of your people Israel, when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear forgive. Isn't it interesting? You notice, notice what he says. Your name will dwell here. Your glory will dwell here. Heaven is your dwelling place. Where does he live? Yes. <laughs> Heaven is his dwelling place. That doesn't even fit him. He's bigger than that. How's he bigger than that? I don't know how he's bigger than that because I don't even know how big that is. It's, it just goes and goes and goes and then God goes a little further. He's just infinite. And yet somehow he comes and puts this, he, he, takes, I don't know, he's all there, and he takes a chunk of his glory and says, it's going to be here, right? And you're going to take it very seriously. So when these pilgrims would ascend to Jerusalem, what did they expect to see? Think about this for a minute. Imagine you're a kid, and you get to go on your first pilgrimage. You're about to see architecture like you will probably never again see in your life. You're about to see the most beautiful building, and you'll never see anything like this, probably again. You'll, you'll probably go back to your, to your farm, or whatever way of life it is you have in the town where you came from. It could be, even be a decent-sized town. But you're never going to see another building like this temple. And when you go home, you're, you're going to think, I can't wait to do that again. And you're going to do these psalms along the way. You're going to see God's people gathered. You're never, you will have never seen this many people in one place. Wow. I didn't even know there were this many people. <laughs> you're going to sing, you're going to hear worship and take part in worship like you never have. There's going to be this, you're going to see the sacrificial system in order to be reminded of the holiness of God, the sinfulness of sin, the cost of forgiveness, the depth and beauty of the grace and mercy of God. You're going to see it all on display there for you and for the people. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. Anybody singing? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, maybe we'll sing this again at some point. We'll have to, won't we? Um, My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. Like, I want to be there. My, My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And listen to this. Who's he jealous of? Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near her altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Like he goes to the temple and he sees that a sparrow has built a nest there and he goes, that's a lucky sparrow. He just used to stay here all the time. (laughs) Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those who strengthen in you. Listen, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Like they go home, they can't wait to go back. It's a there and back again. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. Wherever they go, they're singing, they're praying. The autumn rains also cover with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. They had prayers that strengthened them as they went. That's Psalm 84. Psalm 27. Beautiful. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. God, can I just stay here? 
to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. God, if I could just be here, seeking you with your people, praying these prayers, singing these songs, seeing your beauty in everything around me, in the people, the faces of the people, in, this, in the priest, the songs, everything about this. I love the house where you live, oh Lord. The place where your glory dwells. I love the house where you live. Don't you just love that? Nice house you got. (laughs) So they knew God was everywhere, but they knew God had a place where his name is glory, a place where people would gather for worship and sacrifice, repentance and thanksgiving and joy. And three times a year, they became pilgrims. So, so what does this have to do with us? We do not ascend. Crying out loud, we live in spring, woodlands. Right now, you're probably about 125 feet above sea level. You don't ascend anywhere. Like speed bumps. The first time I came to Texas from East Tennessee, where we have mountains and hills, okay, so we were going to go up to where Kelly's grandmother lived, up in Grimes County. We're all, you know, they had cows, and there was, there was, it's called Darby Hill Farm. Okay, Darby, we're going to Darby Hill Farm. I was just there at Darby Hill Farm yesterday. I've got it on my map, Darby Hill Farm. Give me the directions, Darby Hill Farm. It's on my weather app, Darby Hill Farm. I can tell you when it's going to lightning and thunder at Darby Hill Farm. So uh, for the very first time, I'm going to Darby Hill Farm, and we get out of the car. I'm standing in the background, backyard. I'm looking around, and my future father-in-law walks up to me and says, so what do you what do you what do you think? This is nice. Wow, look at all these land everywhere. Look how big the sky is here. Our sky isn't this big in Tennessee. I said, I'm, just one question. Where's the hill? <laughs> Where's the hill? And he says, you're standing on it. <laughs> it's like, oh, so the hill is the place that's a little higher than everything around it. Yes, it is. So, and it is. It's kind of a rise. It's a hill. It's, Right, we, we don't ascend like they ascended. Um, but this is a nice transition verse because this is what they also knew. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave. Like when I die, you won't leave me there, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Like, There is a path, there's a path, and the path determines your destination, not your intentions, but your path, the path that you get on, it can be a life path, and it's a path that does not lead to decay, but leads to a joyful presence and eternal pleasure at the right hand of God. So, we don't make pilgrimages, we don't even go to holy places. Now, when I first moved to Texas, someone offered me a trip to Israel, and I took it. Um, Wonderful place to visit. It will add a visual dimension, if you will, to your Bible reading. Um, But people kept calling it the Holy Land. Really? Is this more holy than Texas? I mean, I knew it was... It's more holy than Tennessee, right? I mean, <laughs> right? People, people will, there's, there's um, a place where um, Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount and there's a, a, a cathedral, I guess, there. And it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But it was actually personally blessed by Pope John Paul. And so Catholics make pilgrimages there because it was blessed by their favorite Pope. And it's just, you just see them in there just wanting to touch everything and to pray where he prayed and pray where he sprinkled holy water. It's a pilgrimage, right? Because it's a holy place and they might, they'll go back home to a holy place, but this is a holier holy place that's in the holy land, so, like a holy, holy, holy place in a holy country. Like, you've just got the best poker hand you can get there, right? You can't get any holier than that. 
And I just remember like going to the Wailing Wall and people just wanted to go to the Wailing Wall and put a prayer in place, which is t- perfectly fine. I'm not against it. But I just remember thinking, I'm not sure if I want to do that because I don't want to like feel like I'm doing something magic. Like, ooh, this prayer will get answered for sure. You know, like, <laughs> let me put a big one in there, right? I just, it wasn't, it wasn't a pilgrimage for me. And I just know people think of it as pilgrimage. But I didn't think of it as a holy place. So what do, we, what do we, we think of? Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that sounds up-ish. Isn't that in heaven? It's up, right? Up. Okay, we'll, we'll say that. We don't think of it as down, do we? <laughs> um. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. You are a foreigner. Isn't that interesting? Like we Texans, we love to say, you ain't from here, are you? In Christ, you're a foreigner. This isn't your, I don't want to get, okay, come back to this. It's your home, but it's not your home, as is. Um, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Sojourners and exiles, what's a sojourner do? They come but it's, it's not their home. Maybe they were running from something bad and they had to be exiled into your country or maybe they were just staying there for a short amount of time. Maybe they'll get a job and then go on to something else. And that's us. It's that interesting way to describe it. That's you. But there's the interesting thing. Hebrews 11, he's talking about the great saints of, of the Old Testament. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things they promised. They only saw that they, and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. So people like Abraham, he didn't get all the answer to all that he was promised. And he just thought, well, I guess I'm just a stranger here. And these are what the old spiritual songs are, right? I'm just a poor, wayfaring stranger. Right? <laughs> this world of passing through, right? This is the verse I keep coming back to. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Above, that's up, isn't it? Okay. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in so, we're not making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You remember when we were in Revelation? Jerusalem comes to us. They didn't get that in the Psalms of Ascent. Jerusalem didn't travel then. They had to travel to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's coming to us. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, Jerusalem coming down. Jerusalem's coming here, right? Right? But not only that, our life is hidden with Christ and one day he will appear and then we will appear. So the veil that was in the temple then, Christ tore it. It's open access to the Father. So what are we setting our GPS on? We're setting our GPS on Jesus. We pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. We're thinking about the revelation of ourselves at the revelation of Jesus. We're thinking about a new creation, a new Jerusalem. Just so many of the old songs are running through my head. I didn't go to church till I was 20. And somehow I picked up on all the old songs, but... You know, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. 
My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And it just kind of gives us the wrong picture, I think. Like, someday, we're just going to go off into the blue and just be some little something floating around somewhere. We'll get treasure and out there somewhere. But it just seems like when we did Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it ended with everything being made new. So this world is not my home as it is, as it is. We're sojourners, but the new is coming to us. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So these, these Psalms remind us who it is we're seeking, and they're all directed to the Lord, and they're going to describe who he is. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Oh, this is some good psalms. Looking forward to this. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm looking down at it. I'm going, oh, it's so good. But I'm trying not to get out of my head. Um, prayer isn't just getting what you want. Prayer is how you set your mind on things above. As a friend said this week, we take our eyes off of Jerusalem. So to go back... Um, Prayer is how we wage war against the passion of the flesh that takes our eyes off of New Jerusalem. Like there are things in my flesh and things in this world that takes my eyes off of things above. And prayer is how I orient my mind. Prayer is how I keep my GPS set on the right destination. Destination that is both coming to me and destination that is Jesus himself the hope of glory. It's a person. It's a place. Maybe a person in a place. (laughs) I, I, um, I did a summary of Surprised by Joy this week to my students. Surprised by Joy is C.S. Lewis's autobiography about how he came to be a theist and how he became to be a Christian. And it's, it's, the, it's the story of joy and it's the story of longing that he called joy. Um, and it, how it started as a child with uh, books, books about other lands. And he says it created in him a sense of longing. And he called that longing joy because it wasn't anything you ever put your hands on. It wasn't anything you ever get, got to. And he said that the sense of joy also had a little bit of grief mixed in with it. There was a German word for it you don't need to know, but it's like longing. And he said, then he found it in nature, like this sense of longing would just flare up in him. And they would, and he said that when he tried to look at it, it would disappear because it was very shy. And then, he, and then he found it in music that went with the books. And it was just, and then he realized um, that it was all, there was an answer to his longing and it wasn't in a, place like he thought it was. It was in a person. And then it it frightened him. He was, it frightened him because he wanted the answer to his longing. And all of his life, the answer to his longing was in a place, not a person. And he began to, to question himself and he began to ask, what if when I get to the person? What if when I got, get to God, he's not even interested in this? <laughs> what if God says, oh, that longing, that joy you've been looking for? Blah. <laughs> not interested. Um, I don't, what, what am I going to do, right? I thought he would be the answer. <laughs> and then he got there and found out he was. Yay, happy ending. Um <laughs> I just, I just, I, I read that, and it's just, it's, it's like a lifelong story of God just like baiting a hook for twenty five, thirty years, baiting a hook, and just, and it's just fascinating to me because our tendency is to look at people as either in or out. Like you're in the circle of heaven, people are going to heaven. Or you're outside the circle of people going to heaven. But here's the thing. I have friends who are outside the circle at this moment, but I believe they're moving towards Jesus. And to be quite honest with you, I have friends who are inside the circle who seem to be kind of moving away. And if they keep on that path, they're going to be further away, even if they are inside the circle. And at some point, I'm going to kind of wonder, were they inside the circle before? I'm not quite sure, right? 
we, like maybe, sure, it's a good to be, thank God if you're inside the circle, it's a great place to be. But I'm simply saying, um, moving towards is also a wonderful thing as well. Um, so over the next bunch of weeks, I just want us to pray prayers together and just fix our minds on things above. And if you want to think of it as moving on up, we're not moving to Manhattan, but and we're only 150 feet above sea level. So there's really no up to go to. But we're going to set our minds on things above together. And I just wanted to introduce that um, to you. So will you, will you pray with me that we would be able to do just that? Lord, um, really, Jesus, we just want to move with you through this life. You make known to us the path of life. Jesus, you said, um, the kingdom road is a narrow road. The, king, the, the, the path of life is a narrow path. And the path to destruction is, is broad. And so wherever the narrow path takes us, that's, that's the one we want to be on. And we want to be with you. And um, so up, down, around. Um, however we conceive of that, we just want to pray and sing along the way. And we want to do that together. And, and Lord, I, like the people in this room, I look forward to gathering. I look forward to Sundays. Um, but I guess all of life is a pilgrimage of sorts. <laughs> um, there's danger along the way, so I guess it's kind of an adventure as well. But God, if, you're, if we're going to be exiles, it's best to be exiles together. If we're going to be sojourners, I'm, I'm glad to have brothers and sisters be, to be sojourners with. It would be a horrible thing to be in exile all alone. And so I thank you for brothers and sisters to pray with and to sing with. And uh, in the coming weeks, I pray that we'd learn even more how to pray. And I pray, God, that we would find ourselves being rescued from the desires of the flesh that take our eyes off of the kingdom to come. Would you do that for us, God? Would you do that for us? We ask all this in the name of Jesus.